we hope that this lesson today teaches us something about what God wants us to do. And sometimes it's hard to do, but we must do it anyway. Bless the people that are here, bless the ones that are wanted to be here, could not make it, and the ones that are on their way, they make it here safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Bless you. Amen. So we thank God for all of you being here again for our lesson in the book of Joshua, the ninth chapter. I think that's where we stopped at. Ninth chapter. <coughs> the book of Joshua. Yes, yeah, so we're in ja uh, chapter nine. The two scriptures that Deacon Thomas just read. Uh, that's where we stopped off. We talked about uh, these inhabitants or people who lived in the promised land. Just think about them. Uh, and I'm going to ask you this question probably every week until we get out of the book of Joshua. And that's this question. What was Joshua's purpose? Why did God call him to be the leader of Israel? What was he supposed to do as the leader of Israel? Joshua. He was to clean out the land for the, for the promised land because there were people in the land that was, uh, God wanted to get rid of. Okay. He, job he, to take care of. Okay. So, that's true. Yes. He was supposed to clean out everything. Yep, everything. Get rid of all the people, the stuff, the materials, all the Yes. He was supposed to. Uh, both of you are correct in cleaning out the land. The land was inhabited by the, oh, and he named them in that verse two, verse two verses, all of those nations, all those groups of people in uh, verse one and two of Joshua chapter nine, those are the people that were living in the, in Canaan land, let's put it that way. It was called Canaan land, Canaan land, but uh, the Israelites called it the promised land. Right? Because it was promised to them by God. So God told Joshua, you know, through Moses, listen, uh, you got to clean out those, you got to get out everybody that's in that land because this land belongs to you. So good, we understand that. And God wants to clean out everything. So when you get saved, what is God trying to do? So and I remember you got to pull out, I told you this, anytime you talk about war in the Old Testament, you can talk about spiritual warfare in yourself. This is how you can make that parallel for the Old Testament. Let me say that again. When you talk about war in the Old Testament, talk about spiritual warfare for yourself. So let's talk about spiritual warfare real quick. So if God told Joshua to clean out the land, what is God telling you to clean out? <laughs> it's spiritual warfare, right? Clean out everything else. Remember, uh, I think uh, it was Romans. It tells us in chapter 6 that you got to modify the deeds of your body. You got to get rid of that stuff. You do. You have to stop it. You know, so uh, that's what we're supposed to do as born again believers. We have to line ourselves up with the word of God. So it says here, uh, and I'm looking at my particular scriptures that I've studied here. And I said last week, the more boldly the Christian faith advances, the more vocal and violent the opposition will become. The more Christians stand up for what God wants us to do, the more people are going to be violent toward you. You're going to get opposition. You're going to get people that don't like to stand up for God. And here you are trying to stand up for God, and other people are going to get mad because you're trying to stand up for God. And guess what they're going to do? They're going to try to stop you. But you got to look beyond their flesh. Remember, look at that spiritual warfare. Look beyond that flesh and see Satan at work trying to get you to walk away from God. So it appears that all the city-states in, in this momentous, uh, this mountainous re regions uh, join forces. Isn't that something? All of these little towns, we would say, these cities in Canaan land, all of them got together and made one army. Now, mind you, watch this. Before they did that, before they became one, all these little cities, they were fighting each other. They, they were enemies. I mean, they were enemies, enemies of each other. They said, wait a minute, we got a bigger enemy than all of us. 
So we need to come together before they destroy us. Before Israel comes and destroys us, we need to make this one big army so we can go after them. Right? That's what they said. So that's what we learned. Uh, Satan is the same way. He's the same way. Uh, Satan says, if you can't beat them, I'll beat them by joining them. So how many of you know Satan in the church? I mean, you know Satan is in the church. I mean, you know, everybody that come to church don't come to church for the right reason. So that's Satan in the church. That, I mean, you know, people who call themselves preachers are not preaching for the right reason. I mean, I mean, you know, the people who, whatever auxiliary they're in, they don't hold those auxiliaries for the right reason. You may not know it, but eventually, uh, Satan will raise his head. You're going to see it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be as clear as day. You will see it, and then you have to deal with it. So you're saying uh, if there's a minister in the pulpit that ain't right, his Satan is going to show through. It's going to show it. It's going to come through, and we got to deal with it. Perfectly me. So uh, uh, we have to. That's called in the Bible discerning the spirits, and that's anywhere. That's you. You could you could see that in anything in any position. Uh, but yeah, we have to deal with when things happen. But see, we don't we don't know the intents of people's heart, right? We have to see it in the action. It has to come out through their action because I don't know what the intent is. Only God knows. So, but when we see it, then we deal with it. Right? That's the only way we can deal with it. Yes. You know, uh, I do a lot of <clears throat> studying and looking at different things and all that. That's, that's many passages, as I've called. This is one pastor they can call King something. And when he comes in, every time he comes in, people run up to him and just hand him money. Hand him money. He, sits, he was sitting on the throne, and the deacon got sick, and he said he needed some help. And the pastor told him that you should have saved your money. And uh, uh, he had prostate cancer, you know, because everybody getting money. He even owned property, and it was a 78 lady he put out of his property because he she was always paying tithes put on the streets so when she couldn't pay tithes anymore no no she was paying tithes but she used her rent money to pay tithes uh -huh. you know what i'm saying because you know but is this and he knew this about her yeah and he put her out in his own apartment he owned the duplex but he still put her out still put her out see and that, he called himself a man of god but my question is the desire of the spirits would say I wouldn't be going to that church no more. <laughs> so I would have left it a long time ago. They should have saw who he was, saw that. If they were if they were really studying scripture, which is first Timothy, second Timothy, and Titus. That's any if you want to know anything about a preacher and a deacon, read first Timothy, second Timothy, and Titus. That tells you everything about a preacher. And if he's not lining up with that, either the members call him on the carpet. About 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, or Titus, or you line up with what he's doing. Now, if you line up with what that preacher is doing, then you're saying, you're, you're going to overlook the word of God, what it says about the preacher and the deacon, and say, oh, we love him, though. We like him. We're going to go ahead and, and keep him anyway. So now, whatever happens to them, like this lady, that is their fault. Because they should have, what? Discern that that man wasn't right a long time ago. Yes. The gift of discernment. All Christians have gift of discernment. No, but they have, all Christians can study to the point of understanding main doctrines of scripture. Right? So you can actually, you say we have, I have a guest preacher here and he's preaching and he says something that you're not used to hearing. So you probably come to me first. And say, you know, he said this from the pulpit. Is that right? Now, if he had guessed, okay, I said, well, I find out that that's a doctrine that he taught, and he wouldn't come back here, right? So, but if he was a minister here, and he said that, then I can talk to that minister, uh, pull him to the side, and really talk about that doctrine that he was trying to to speak across the pulpit from. See, we can challenge him on scripture if he's here. But the whole thing is. The attitude of a person, the action of a person, the teachings of a person is going to come out. And when you, when it does come out, guess what you got to do with if it? If it's not lined up with the Bible, we have to make sure it does line up with the Bible. And then we have to either question them about it, the teaching, or their behavior, or say, brother, your behavior not lining up with the scripture. You said you're a preacher. You said you're a thinker. 
But your behavior don't line up with 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Maybe I got it wrong. Maybe, maybe I got it wrong. Help me understand why you're not lining up with 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So once they tell me, then I said, well, uh, are you still going to continue to have five women on the side? Well, if that's what you believe, I can't pick, Pastor. I just can't pick which one I want. Well, I'm going to go ahead and let you go ahead and leave till you decide that the Bible says you're going to have one woman. That's what it says, right? For, for a deacon and a preacher, right? And for any Christian, right? The husband of one wife. So until you decide which wife you want, uh, we're going to go ahead and let you go. You can't be a deacon here, you can't be a preacher here. That's how it's supposed to go. If you go, oh, that's not right, everybody's sin. So that means if everybody's sin, so everybody can do whatever they want to do in the church? No. When you're in leadership, when you're in leadership, yes, you live in a glass house. And everybody is looking in, and everybody going to hold you accountable to this book. They are. Yes. Correct them. Show them the correction. Well, you know, sister, I all have seen. Right, and once again. And God forgive me. Mm -hmm. You got to take it to, uh, that takes me to Romans, the sixth chapter again. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Just because that person walking in sin don't mean it's right. right. And just because, so you're saying, because we all sin, we all gonna sin anyway, so we might as well accept that all of us gonna sin, and you gonna still let me be the leader of this church, and we all just gonna sin and do whatever we want to do. That's not how scripture works. Yes. So I, I, what, what I have experienced on, on a regular basis, I know it's like there's a difference between mistakes or you sin without thinking, willfully, but yes. then the willfully sin is another thing. You know it's wrong, but you do it anyway. Yes. And and I noticed that in my mind how you you can you can discern between Satan and God. You know anything that's not of God is of Satan, belongs to Satan. That's so in true. my mind I actually hear him say, Well, such and such do this, such and such did that, this and all that. And I have to say actually say, Hold on, I, I, I have nothing to do with what they do. <laughs> that's I right. can't continue to do this because she does this or he oh, does, he does. that. He get, you think he's getting away with this. Right. Well, you think right. she's right. getting away with that. Well, nothing happened to her. And the two sermons I preached about why the bad things happen to so-called good people and don't waste your opportunity, those two sermons actually deal with that. You can't worry about what everybody else is doing right. Right. because guess what? Death right. going to come to them too. And then, and just because you don't see bad things happening to them and you see them doing wrong, remember this, they still got to stand before God. They're not getting away with nothing. Nobody gets away with anything. Nobody. So they have to understand. Well, I don't see nothing. And just, just always remember this. The reason bad things don't happen to people that sin all the time and willfully sin it, because God gives them an opportunity to what? Right Change. Grace and mercy. Every time they wake up, every time they get up, God giving them an opportunity to change. I was talking about that guy in Las Vegas when I preached today. But I'm just, just a little bit about him. Do you think God gave that man, he was 64 years old, you think God gave him an opportunity to get saved before, before his last Sunday? Yeah. Yeah. I, don't, I didn't know what happened. Oh, he, he got someone that shot and killed oh, all his people. people. Yeah, yeah. So, so that man, 64 years old, God allowed him to live to be 64 years old. You can't tell me that God didn't give that man opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to change his heart. People say, I don't know why he did it. I'll tell you why he did it. It's hatred. That's what hatred. You can't love, you can't say you love people and kill people just because. So there has to be, the, the, the bottom line is there has to be hatred in his heart to even commit an act that way. So what is the motive? The motive is hatred. We don't know why he hated people. That's what you can say. But you know he hated human beings. You can't say he loved human beings and shoot up. I, I really tried to kill all 500 of them, but I couldn't only get about 50. You can't say he loved anybody, love human, love life. He could not. So they could tell me how good a person he was. He took his grandkids out. He had a million dollar home. He had this. He had a girlfriend. I don't care what he had. He hated people for whatever reason. And his hatred, guess what? It showed. His hatred came out through what? 
murder. Remember, we, talk, we were talking about, the, that's something I'm thinking about the Ten Commandments now, but we were talking about when we were talking about murder, I think we were talking about that this Tuesday coming up. Uh, what the, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not murder. That's what that is. Uh, intentionally, that's what that means. Because we got to talk about, on you know, Tuesday, Bible says we're going to talk about the difference between a military guy killing, a police officer killing, or you just willfully killing somebody. That there is a difference between murder and, and, and death when it comes down to how a person kills a person. You know, manslaughter, attempt, you know, we got all kinds of types of things. But what the Bible is mentioning in the tenth command in that commandment is this: you shall not kill intentionally, just because. No. And he was killing just because. Out of hatred, whatever that hatred was. You can't say it was hatred because of race, because the people he killed was all white. Well, and the black cop that died, you know, one black cop died, another black cop was injured. The black cop that was died was the guy who was trying to be a hero for everybody else. He trying to save people. He died trying to save people. So you can't say it was a racial thing, because he was shooting it. Most of them was all white. Well, all of them were white, except one. Yes. God gave him opportunity because all that plotting he did. All that plotting. All that time it took for him to do that. Mm -hmm. He went to other places and, 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 and set up some doing. stuff. Mm -hmm. Now God gave him all that time to repent, say, mm -hmm. no, I shouldn't be doing this. Yes. But he plotted, he even plotted out how many people, more people he could kill by targeting. Yes. yes. It, was, it, was, it was horrible. And 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 you knew he plotted, because the gay girlfriend a hundred thousand dollars gave, hey baby, go ahead and take this, because you ain't gonna see me no more after the day. Right. He done mailed her 100000 They said he took out almost $10,000 for something else. So he, this was strategically planned. So this hatred, he knew he probably wasn't going to live after that day. He, he knew that. He had that. He planned. He had a plan of killing himself after. He knew that was going to happen. So mind you, when you talk about hatred and talk about why people do what they do, they have the motive of it all, especially when you kill another people, is hatred. Is hatred uh, for human life. And we may not know why he hated, but it might come out. We're going to find something out. I don't know. Somebody knows something. I tell you that. And I think the girlfriend ain't telling everything. Oh, he, what's she going to say? He was the nicest person in the world. She can't say that. I don't care what. She said, if she can say, I'm the most shocked person out of everybody. You mean the closest person to you didn't know you was something else? In the first place, see that hatred didn't start on last Sunday. I just want to let you know that it didn't start there. We just saw the result of his hatred for whatever reason. Now let's go to verse three through fifteen. Now three through fifteen, we're going to read it all. We're going to go back and explain it. So the first two verses, we understood that that was amazing. But watch this. We said we we're going to get to this today. We got to get to it today. Remember, I might have to stop five minutes after ten. Wherever time it is, stop me five minutes. After 10. Watch this. This is an amazing, we call this the scam. Watch this scam. Verse 3 through 15. I'm reading for a different Bible called the uh, NET Bible, just, just to, to mind you, remind you what, what this version is. This is a paraphrase Bible, but I have to read it from here so you can understand it quickly because of, for the sake of time. Read verse 3 through 15. Now, when the residents of Gibeon Heard what Joshua did to Jericho and Ai. Stop right there. The residents of Gibeon. That means these people lived where? In Gibeon. Gibeon evidently had to be in Canaan land. Right? Just remember that. It's another city in Canaan land. So in other words, let's, let's think about this. We're in, we're in Michigan. So Michigan has about five, six hundred cities in it. Right? Maybe a thousand. Maybe a thousand cities in Michigan, well, all of 1,500. Just, just think about that. God said, Israel, you got Michigan. So I want you to kill everybody in Michigan so you can have Michigan. So here, here we're in Detroit. So he, they start off with the big city. They start off with a little, okay, we're going to go ahead and go to Southfield first, get rid of them. Now, you know, once we, we, got, we heard about all the people dying in Southfield, we done heard about it by now. Then he said, okay, now we're going to go over here to Oak Park. We're going to wipe all everybody out of Oak Park because that's our city too. So we heard about Oak Park and Southfield. So now Detroit, Novi, and everybody else started getting together. Look, we got to stop these folks. 
from coming out. We're going to get our army together and we're going to stop this. But one city, one city, the Royal Oak said, no, we're we gonna, we not going to be a part of that. Well, we're going to tell them, we're going to disguise ourselves and tell them this. And this is the scam that they did. Go to verse, verse 4. They did something clever. The Gibeonites didn't join the army with everybody else to go against Israel. They said, we're going to do something else. They did something clever. They collected some provisions and put war, war put worn out sacks on their donkeys, along with worn out wineskins that were ripped and patched. Verse 5, they had worn out patched sandals on their feet and dressed in worn out clothes. All their bread was dry and hard. Now verse 6, they came to Joshua at the camp of Gilgal and said to him and the men of Israel, we have come from a distant land, make a treaty with us. So what was the scam? Trying to trick what was the trick? What was the trick? They, everybody live in Michigan. They are a city in Michigan. They roll up. So roll up, folks. We gonna act like we didn't come from Michigan. You know, we come. We come from California, and so we've been traveling for three days. Now we know. I don't know what's going on in Michigan, but we don't come from Michigan. We come from California. Here's our proof. Look at our shoes. They worn out. Our clothes are worn out. Now they live in Michigan, they, but they lie. Our, our food is dry, we've been traveling a long time. We don't, I don't know what's going on, Joshua. But listen, we do not come from Michigan. But so guess what we want you to do with us, Joshua? Make a treaty with us that you won't harm us. You see that trick? Yeah. Watch this. But what did God tell Joshua? Kill everybody in Michigan, right? So, so Joshua, Joshua and his leaders are, okay, they, they don't come from Michigan, so let's go ahead and make a treaty with them. Watch, verse 3 says, verse, verse 7, the men of Israel said to the, to the Hivites, perhaps you live near us. So how can we make a treaty with you? Verse 8, but they said to Joshua, we are willing to be your subjects. So Joshua said to them, who are you and where do you come from? They told him, your subjects have come from a very distant land because of the reputation of the Lord your God, for we have heard the news about all he did in Egypt and all he did to the two, to the two Amorite kings on the other side of Jordan, Shihon king uh, of Heshbon and Ak, king of Bashan and Ashtaroth. Verse 11, our leaders and all who live in our land told us, take provisions for your journey and go meet them. Tell them we are willing to be your subjects. Make a treaty with us. Verse 12, this bread of ours was worn when we packed it in our warm, when we packed it in our homes the day we started out to meet you. But now it is dry and hard. Verse 13, these wineskins we feel were brand new, but look how they have ripped our Clothes and sandals have worn out because it has been a very long journey. Verse 14, the men examined some of their provisions, but they failed to ask the Lord's advice. You should underline that right there. No discernment. They examined it, okay. They had a feeling, you guys live close to us. I think I remember, no, it's not us. We come from a faraway country. So they had a gut feeling that they lived there, and then they said, okay, let's examine what they said. Okay, it does look worn out, it does. But they failed to do what? Ask the Lord's advice. Watch this. In verse 15, Joshua made a peace. No, he you know, made a mistake. Joshua made a peace treaty with them and agreed to let them live. The leaders, and I know they probably said, they laughing, woo, we made it out of that one, boy, because he was coming to our city next anyway. We made it out of that one. We, we got a treaty. Watch this. The leaders of the community sealed it with an oath. So now Joshua, he didn't go in prayer. He didn't say, hold on, y'all. You know, we got to pray about this. But God said, and I think they lied to us anyway, but let's go pray about it. Let's find out. Let me ask you a question, and you probably may not have known this. In the Old Testament, when they wanted to ask the Lord for something to make sure it was done, they would use something called the Urim and the Thurim, which is like little stones, and it was almost like rolling dice. 
It was almost like gambling, and they, whatever, however the method was, they would roll these stones or let, throw these stones down, and whatever, how they read the stones would let it know if it was a yes or a no. That was, these stones were on the high priest um, hat. The ermine would throw either on his shoulders or on his hat. He would take those stones off. They were like, okay, if it don't come out number seven, then guess what? They lie. If it comes out number seven, then they tell them that God wants us to keep them. They didn't even do that. He just automatically said, we're going to make a treaty with them. They could have even did that and let the dice roll. We used to call it fleecing the Lord. You know, y'all know what that is, fleecing the Lord. Let me tell you what y'all used to do. Lord, if you want me to do this when I wake up in the morning, let it be dry on the side of this street <laughs> and let the dew be on this side. Y'all know y'all used to do that. That's called fleecing the Lord. We don't even do that no more. We don't even pray and ask God if it's your will. We don't even ask God if it's his will to marry this person. We don't even ask God if it's, if it's his will to be in business with this person. We just go ahead and do it. And then when we, when we run into the mistakes, when we run into the consequences of it, then guess what? You didn't ask the Lord. The number one problem with Christians today when it comes down to fighting the devil is what? We don't go to God in prayer. That's your number one weapon. You only got two weapons against the devil. The word of God and prayer. That's what you got. And if you don't use your prayer and you don't use the word, how are you going to fight the devil? You are in a spiritual fight. You got to use your spiritual tools. And your spiritual tools, and some people may think you kind of over the top when you tell them, I got to go to the Lord. I, I don't know about you. I, I can make hasty decisions. I have to ask the Lord. And when I ask the Lord, if he give me confirmation, then I'll do it. I don't know, it might take six months, it might take two years, but guess what? I need confirmation for myself. I told you last week, uh, the last time I did that, like fleece the Lord, is when I was about to get married. I told you that I fasted for seven days. I said, Lord, because me and my, uh, my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, we had this little falling out. So she didn't want to talk to me. She didn't want to, I said, Lord, I said, I guess that's it. Uh, I'm going to find me another girlfriend then. <laughs> right? But the Lord, said, the Lord said, hold on, wait a minute. So I, was, I said, Lord, if she is to be my wife, this is what I did. Now see, at least God bless me in my ignorance. If she is to be my wife, I'm a fast for seven days. And if she don't call me within seven days, I'm going to go ahead and move on. She waited to the seventh day. Lord Jesus. I was about to move. I was hungry too, but I was about to move on. <laughs> I was hungry. So she better hurry up and call me every day because I got a hamburger on my back. She better call me today. She, do you know she called me on the seventh day? She called me, and we've been married for 27 years today. I guess the Lord was right, I guess. He blessed me in my ignorance. But had I walked away and just, just said, no, she's not the one, because we had a little fight, they were a little argument, then guess what? I, I would have missed out. But this is what he's saying. These people, here's Joshua, he go ahead and make a treaty with people that he don't even know. He didn't even ask the Lord. Our problem is not asking God. So watch this, the Gibeonites, back in verse 17, and you don't have to read it again, included a league of cities. They were a part of that. They were, they were part of all of that, right? Uh, uh, look at uh, where they said, oh yeah, verse 24. They concocted a clever trick, right? So they had a trick, now watch this. They use the same trick the devil uses. The devil uses strategy of deceiving people. He uses strategy of tricking people, coming up with scams spiritually, as we talked about. And uh, we talked about people with their false doctrines. If we don't study the word of God, how do we know what the preacher is saying from the pulpit is true or not if you don't know the word yourself? That's why here we want our deacons and our leaders to be this way. We want them to know the word of God, so when a preacher comes in here, you know if they said something on the side of their neck. You already know. Because you're going to base it. You're not, you're not basing it on their personality. That's not what you're looking at. You're not looking at the delivery. You're not looking at how he preached. You're looking at what he's saying. That's 
that's what you got to say. So when the preacher come here, and I may not know this about the person, they say, listen, I want, we're going to do a $25 line uh, 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 offering right now. We stop preaching, we're going to do a $25 line so each one of y'all can be blessed if you touch my hand. Now, see, automatically, red flag should be going up in your mind. Wait, wait a minute. Pastor don't believe it. He don't believe it, man. And the scripture don't even talk about that. But this is what some people will say. Well, the pastor got him up there anyway, so evidently he must be all right. So we're going to go ahead and get this $25. I'll tell you right now, somebody come and tell you to start caring, you better put your $25 in your pocket. And say, well, we're going to wait till this time is over with, because evidently he don't know Christian Life Baptist Church. <laughs> he don't know. So I try to make it my business to bring people here, and I messed up a couple of times, but I'll try to bring people in here that agree with the Word of God the way we agree with the Word of God. We have to be really careful about that, and I'm taking my time even more so uh, recently to understand that, that when we have a guest preacher and if I invite somebody here, I want that person to line up. I'm not going to bring somebody in here that's totally different from us. I can't do that. Because he's, he may say something that may not line up with God's word. But because we are a teaching church, you already know. It will be a red flag come to your mind. And you'll know not to listen to that false doctrine, right? So that's, that's what we try to get everybody to know. Because that's how the devil comes in. He comes in as a deceiver. He may come in one way, and you all in agreement, but... Four weeks later, they done showed their true self. <clears throat> See, I thought he came, he came in like us, but now since he's here, guess what? Now he begins to show his true self. And when that, if that happens, guess what we got to do? We got to deal with it then. We can't let it go just because they've been here a year. They've been here two years. Anytime anybody rise up with a false doctrine or false teaching, guess what you got to do? Guess what you got to do? You got to discern and you got to deal with it at that time. There's a musician coming in. Uh, what time is it we have? What time we got? It's 10 o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. Okay, so watch this and we go this last one. Close with this. We got about five minutes. So their goal was successful. They did it. The scam worked. The scam worked. What were they trying to get? I want a treaty with Israel so they won't what? Destroy us. They won't kill us, and it worked. So what do you think going to happen in the future? Because God, the reason why God said clean out all of Michigan and get everybody out of there, because God had plans for Israel to come in and take over. Now, you messing up his plan. But guess what God is going to do? Sometimes we got to understand this, and we might talk about this a little bit more next week. And that's this. How is it going to mess up God's plan, and can God... Fix a plan. Can God's plan work even when we don't line up with his plan? Yeah, he got. He's got. So he's going to make sure that no matter whatever we do, whatever decision we make, God knows how to get around that little mess up decision that you made and actually get his plan still done. That's what we're going to see next week. It's not a problem at all. So this is what you got to understand about, and we talked about this today, uh, the deception of Satan. We talked about discernment today. So keep those in mind. Anytime you want to know about anything about the Word of God, it's in there. Is it there? You have any questions, come and ask me. Say, Pastor, I've been thinking about this teaching. I've been thinking about this doctrine. I've been thinking about this. Okay, okay, ask me. So we can look. If I don't know, I'm going to find out. I'm going to look for it. Yes, sir. I got a few things I've been studying on. Okay. And, uh, it, just, it just, like I say, I listen. I don't believe everything, but I do study. Okay. Like, like for example, it's called the Holy Bible, but the word Bible is not in the Bible. Okay. That, that I, I found the origin of it. It's really called the Holy Scriptures. Mm -hmm. Now this this woman at my job, which is my manager, is Jehovah Witness, and her father came to visit her, and she brought me in because they know I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. So he's an older man, and me and him, he's trying. He think he can convert me to to be a drum witness. So oh, we have a little space. So okay. we're able to sit down and talk. So I'm preparing myself, uh, reading on Jehovah Witness, how it starts, everything, and what they believe, what they don't believe, and uh, I got a good grip on it, mm -hmm. uh, what they don't. 
Uh, I'm gonna wait till he called me. But the whole point is, you know, I didn't go against him. I didn't buck with him because I respect. And plus, she's my boss. So <laughs> right. he's going on him. I'm talking about, you know, getting a debate with him. It's the way you talk to people. Right. It's so, all about how you sit there. Right. And I'll tell you, I told like the guy on my job came up to me and said he was a black Israelite. So if I was to shut down from him right. and not listen to what he had to say, I would say, you are. I said, I don't need to talk to you. I said, it's just like, so I heard you was a pat. I said, yeah, yeah, come on, let's talk. So we start talking, and then I said, you start comparing what we believe to what he believes. I didn't have to get upset with him. Right. We didn't have to argue, because what's the end of the day is you're going to walk away with what you believe. Right, regardless. He's, he's not, I'm not going to bad change you. You're that's, not going to bad change me. That's the point. Right. you got to be confident in what you right. believe. Right. Right. And I, I said, well, see, the scripture says this, brother. And then if you don't know the answer, you, know, you can come to me. Right. You can keep doing more search. Right. But I guarantee you. You don't have to get to an argument right. with anybody sure, about the Bible. I made sure that, but I explained to right from the get-go that, that your 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 Bible mm -hmm. with, uh, is called the Holy Scriptures. I said if you put them together, your words has been changed. That's why it's called the New Translation. <laughs> right. the, his Bible is, is not worded the same. Like no. for example, John, in the beginning was the Word and was with God and the Word was God. It mm -hmm. says and here's the same thing, but it didn't when it says the Word. It says a God. Right. It changed. It, it changed, changed the whole meaning. So they did that purposely. Right. Right. And, and they said, who did that? I read and found out the guy who changed it. Mm -hmm. A man, and it was only, I think, in 1817 or 1800. So the whole point I'm saying, there's no debate right there. You, no. He changed the Bible. He changed the Word of God. Right. And What's that's it? what we have to understand that. When you get into situations like right. that, you got to know. That's why we're talking about studying to show yourself approved. You have to know what you believe according to the Word of God. Any other comments? Any other questions about that? Yes. I, I remember when, when we was younger, and uh, <laughs> it was on a Saturday. These Jehovah's Witnesses kept coming over to the house. And I kept saying, wait till you see my brother. I'm going to get my brother. <laughs> <laughs> and then they finally came over when you was dead. And I said, get him, dear. <laughs> and you just looked at me.